Hello and welcome to Bible study this week. I'm Pastor Joe and it's a privilege to be with you as we dive into God's Word. So before we begin, let's open with prayer. God the grower, God the harvester, God the redeemer who brings us to you. Thank you for all of your action in nurturing and growing us in faith and in love and mostly in relationship with you. We pray that you continue to be with us, strengthen us as we move forward into the time ahead. In your son's name we pray, amen. As always, the lessons are behind us and are also in the email. Um, so for this week, we will begin by looking in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 to 13. So I invite you to go ahead and pause the video, read Isaiah 55, 10 to 13. Now, before we dive into these few verses, I think it's important to note that um, Isaiah is believed to have been written in multiple parts, that the actual prophet Isaiah wrote most of the first and then some of the later chapters that are interspersed. Um, the prophet Isaiah wrote those while in Jerusalem, while speaking to the people. Um, a lot of these um, these passages that are contained in what is called First Isaiah talk about God's sovereignty, God's power, and how um, God will always protect his people. And then there's a slightly different tone in most of the latter of Isaiah and some chapters that have been inserted near the beginning. And a lot of these chapters are doubtful. There's a lot of kind of darkness there, and there's um, a lot of Isaiah speaking a promise into this darkness. These chapters are believed to have been written years later while Israel is in exile in Babylon. And so this prophet is speaking, um, speaking the promise, the reassurance of God to a people who've forgotten that, a people who doubt, a people who wonder whether God has cut them off. So with that, that's the context to which these people are hearing these words spoken to them saying the rain and the snow have come down. This is a great understanding of the water cycle. Nurture the earth and then go back up. We don't see anything happening with the rain and the water then because they're in the ground, they're in the plants, they're doing their thing to make all this other stuff grow forward and then it evaporates and then it comes down again. There's not a constant cycle of water going back and forth. So even though you're not seeing God acting right now, know that God's word has come down and it's somewhere out there working and then it will come back up. And that's what Isaiah is promising them here. That maybe you don't see anything acting right now, but it's coming. And so what you should be looking for instead of maybe God acting, we've heard God's word. The word that comes forth from my mouth, it will not return me empty, but it will accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So what is that going on? And then we hear this beautiful imagery of the um, you going out in joy, the mountains and the hills breaking out and singing, the trees clapping their hands, that there's all this other thing happening, that that's what you should be looking out for and how God's purpose is being accomplished in the world and how the world rejoices when that happens. So the takeaway from this for me is that even if we can't see the explicit um, majesty or wonders of God working. Look for the things that God is doing in the meantime. God's word has gone out. See how it's nurturing before we see the return of that majesty again. Our second reading comes from Romans. So go ahead and pause. Flip to Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Here we see Paul talking about life in the spirit, and Paul draws a duality between life in the flesh and life in the spirit. Before we get into this, it's important to note that um, this is a very dualistic thinking. It was one or the other. The flesh is set against God. The spirit is for God. Um, and these definitions aren't always the most helpful. Remember that in, this, in the ancient world, 
um, the guts were supposed to be your center of higher thinking. So a lot of times uh, the word splachnos is the Greek word for guts, and that's what they talk about when I'm, when I'm thinking. So remember that a lot has changed in our understanding of physiology. So the word flesh is not the most helpful for me here because when we think of flesh, a lot of times that gets twisted to mean any kind of physical pleasure and say if it's a physical pleasure, God isn't for it. And that's just not true. Um, God has created us um, with flesh, with bodies to experience pleasure and pain and all the things of this world. And so just because something gives us physical pleasure does not mean it's against God's will, but it's what's underlying this, right? If we set our minds only on those things that give us pleasure, that's where the problem comes. Whereas what Paul is inviting us to do is to set our mind on what God wants for us. And if in the course of what God wants for us, we get pleasure, that's not wrong. So it's where do we, where are we focusing on? If our goal is only to build up these pleasures, that's what Paul's warning again, not in getting them just for their own sake. I know a fascinating verse to me in this that I'll ask a question about um, on, the, on the description is in verse 3, where it says, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to deal with sin. So the question then is, did God ever expect the law to do what Jesus ultimately did? Was there ever a time when God expected that humans could follow the law and be justified on our own? And then the question that continues to get asked and that continues to, to wrestle, to, to bounce around in my head is then why did God wait so long? If God knew the law couldn't, could, if God knew that we couldn't live up to the law, why wait so long for Jesus? So I'll have a little more about that in, um, in the question and the description. Um, short answer is no, I don't think that God ever expected um, that the law, that we could fulfill the law. But I think then that God's grace extends beyond what we can possibly imagine. And I think the temptation is that Christians sometimes fall into another law-abiding religion, that in order to really prove that you are a follower, these are the things you have to do. Whether that's X, Y, or Z, there's a great many different things that each different tradition or denomination says, these are, these are the laws that you have to follow to be a Christian. And I think we need to be careful of that. Because ours is a religion of grace, that doesn't mean there's no rules or no laws, but to exclude based on unobservance to a law is not a Christian religion. We are a religion of grace, and by grace the Spirit has come into us, and by grace we are saved. Our final reading is from Matthew chapter 13, it's verses 1 through 9 and 18 through 23. So go ahead and pause one more time and flip to Matthew 13, 1 to 9, and 18 to 23. We hear a bunch of parables here in this time in Matthew, and today it's the parable of the sower. So as you read this, I want to ask, where do you hear hope? in this passage. What? Take a moment and think about that. Where do you hear hope in this passage? Jesus tells this parable of seeds that are scattered and land in four different areas. Some on the path, where the birds eat them. Some on the rocky ground, where they sprang up quickly but then died. Some in too much sun, where they were scorched. And then some in the thorns, and they are choked. So we have all these different places where the seeds are scattered and can't grow. But then these other seeds fell on good soil, and those bring forth more than what was put in the ground, some 100-fold, some 60, some 30. Where is the hope in that? The fear, before we get to the hope that I have, that is that we see this and we identify ourselves in one category or the other. Oh, we are the good seed. We have been producing, but they have fallen in the thorns, or they fell on the path. They sprung up quickly, and then they died. And so I think the hope, then, is not to see ourselves in one of these, but to see how, at different times, we all fall into all of these categories. 
I know um, there are times where I do feel like I'm a good seed. I have, I have spread the word of God and I can see fruits of my actions. And then I see times where I, <laughs> this uh, is so, um, so fitting. They sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched. How easy it is to think you're spreading good seed at one point and then realize a little while down the line, I never really did anything with that. I jumped ship before I finished what God had in store for me. So I think it doesn't need to be one or the other, that we're not judged based on where we fell. I think this is this is Jesus speaking and saying, these are the kind of things that can happen when the word of God hits you. There's not just one time where you hear the word of God, you make that choice and it's over forever. But that every time we see God appear before us, whether that's through a sermon, through a song, through an act of a stranger on the street, wherever, whenever we see God appear before us, that's a new way that the word of God is appearing to us. And we always have a choice. What do we do with it at that point? And we pray that through the grace of God that Paul says dwells within us and brings us to the Spirit, that we are good soil as often as possible. And we know that when we fall short, there is grace. So I pray that God is with you and shows you grace and gives you the opportunity to be good soil, to have seeds sprout up from you this week. Until next week, amen.